Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring Sys Admin Expert, Don Pizzette. DevOps Engineer, Justin Dennison. Security Specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. Hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam. We've got uh, most of the normal crew here today. We have Don Pizzette, of course. How you doing, Don? I am super excited about doing an episode without Daniel. Yeah. I think it's, <laughs> it's, this is going to be the big one. Well, this is the, the, the episode where we get to find out who the problem is. Uh, if it's <laughs> him or Justin Dennison. Justin, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, and uh, I plead the fifth. Okay. Yep. I'm, I'm assuming it's... It's Justin, but we'll see. And filling in um, for Daniel, uh, filling in those very big shoes, is Mr. Ronnie Wong. How you doing, Ronnie? I'm doing well. Uh, excited to be here uh, for the first time. Thanks. Yeah, this is your first time since we kind of changed the the format, right? You've you've been on past episodes for. Uh, he was on Technado 1.0. That's, yeah, yeah, or point oh. Old school, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was the pre-release, the yeah, the beta, the <laughs> alpha. Uh, it was but, shot with an old eight millimeter camera, yeah, <laughs> and a stick, yeah. And someone who uh, who we actually had on back then as well. I think I, I want to say like late 2018 uh, is joining us again today. Christian Brinkoff, how you doing, Christian? I'm doing well, guys. So thanks for having me back on the show. Yeah, thank Great you for, to be for joining us again. I mean. It's, it's rare that someone will not only come on the show, but then agree to do it again after having participated <laughs> in it. So uh, we're very happy for that. And we've got uh, a lot to talk about with you because when, when we spoke last time, you were in a completely different role. Well, same yep. kind of field, but, uh, but very different uh, uh, how you were, were working there. So let's go ahead and find out all about the changes uh, in our first segment, Rapid Fire Questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, Christian, we have five minutes. We're going to go round robin questions. You got about 45 seconds to a minute. You go over time. Peter's going to budge you. We're going to move on and act like nothing happened. And Peter's going to take our first question. I am. All right. So, as I mentioned, Christian, last time we spoke, you were um, an, a Microsoft MVP. So, but, but, so, that's outside of Microsoft. And now you actually uh, work for Microsoft as a, uh, I've got it here, senior technical specialist for Windows Virtual Desktop. So, uh, what led you to, uh, to make that move and, and move from kind of the outside to, to the inside there? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, by the way, and it puts me on a great spot to do it uh, in a very short of, uh, amount of time. <laughs> uh, so, um, so yeah, since we last spoke, I was an, uh, a freelancer. Uh, my company got acquired, have its logics by Microsoft, and I was in a situation that um, sort of like, like was investigating if uh, working for Microsoft was a good fit for me. And that uh, it turned out great because Microsoft really is a very open open company right now and in a curve and it's part of a digital transformation as well. And and yeah, I was in the opportunity or I had the opportunity to join the Windows for your desktop team to bring that product to the market. Uh, and and yeah, how, how many times in, in your life, how many times in your life do you get like the opportunity to represent uh, like a sort of a startup product inside a large company uh, like Microsoft? So I took the opportunity and I, I must admit uh, it, it has been a great journey so far. So uh, yeah, that, that made me uh, do the move and, and I did, did not regret it, obviously, because yeah, the interest and, and everything around like WVD Windows for your desktop service, where we're going to talk about later on as well during this conversation, yeah, is amazing. So. Stop the time. <laughs> now, along with this, uh, this seems very technical and sounds a like a lot of hard work. You also list yourself as a global black belt. Unless that's a challenge, could you tell us a little <laughs> bit more about that? <laughs> so normally when I start uh, talking in presentations and I say that I'm uh, a global black belt, some people think about ninja or something. Um, yeah. The global black belt is basically that you're a part of an incubation team within Microsoft. So a startup team or startup product and, and, and a team that brings the product to the customer. So basically sitting between Microsoft Corp and Redmond and the fields in like subsidiaries and countries, helping uh, that country to yeah, educate that uh, team, the cloud solution architect team. We call it the CSU, all those things uh, together and as well events, technical marketing. Uh, yeah. That, that is basically a global black belt role. So it's a very dynamic global role uh, representing a new product within Microsoft. So, yeah. Now, we're going to be talking... Yeah, We're going to be talking more about Windows Virtual Desktop here in a minute, but uh, there was a quote that you put out not too long ago where you said that 2020 
is the year of Windows Virtual Desktop. So can you elaborate on that? Like, what, why is this year the year? Yeah, so if you are active in uh, virtual desktop uh, in the VDI industry for a very long time, you know that every year there's sort of like an ongoing debate that this will be the year of VDI. And since, um, since we're all active in, in, in a very negative situation, which is called COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, we saw a very huge uplift in terms of the interest and as well the um, yeah, consumption on Azure of using Windows Virtual Desktop. And that really took off in, like when COVID started in, in March. And yeah, that interest and as well before that uh, moment in, in WVD, uh, yeah, made me think that yeah, this year will be the year of Windows Virtual Desktop. And the reason because I say that is, first of all, Windows Virtual Desktop enables a customer very quickly to use, uh, yeah, virtualization, desktop virtualization technology. So you can use uh, like your full desktop or your applications directly from Azure, uh, yeah, very easily. And as well, you get to get up to speed very quickly because the uh, yeah, environment is pre-built for you in terms of the control plane. So all those services that you normally had to build up yourself in a traditional environment are all packed and, and like combined in a uh, service solution, which is called Windows Virtual Desktop, which is basically a desktop as a service solution that runs on Azure. So that's the huge success behind it. And, and Microsoft did not do that like in the past before, and that's a game-changing way of doing uh, RDS and desktop yeah, virtualization on Azure. And, and that in combination with uh, yeah, the interest on yeah, re remote working from home, uh, yeah, that makes, uh, makes me say that 2020 and maybe uh, 2021 as well will be the year of Windows Virtual Desktop. So, All right, our last interview was just a couple of months uh, after uh, FX Logic, your former employer, was that, or your former employer was uh, acquired by Microsoft. How has Microsoft been using the FS Logic technology as they've been uh, continuing on? Yeah, that's a great question. So FS Logic is uh, acquired because of uh, yeah some of the uh, yeah performance concerns that uh, yeah RDS had back in the days running FS uh, or running uh, Office three sixty five products on top of a desktop virtualization environment, uh, which can be done with the FS Logic technology. And that was the main reason. And as well, uh, yeah, the enhancement of other like performance concerns like logon duration, uh, enhancement of uh, application delivery, all those things are now part of the fundament of Windows Virtual Desktop. And that's built uh, basically on top of the FS Logics product, or it is basically the FS Logics yeah, products like the profile container and the app masking product that is sitting on top of your virtual machine, your session host within Windows Virtual Desktop that enhances enhances the environment to yeah, give you the, that native experience that you uh, are, yeah, are, yeah, are familiar with, like using Office 365 on a physical device as well on a virtual yeah, desktop environment running on Azure as part of Windows Virtual Desktop. So that's the key element of that. And uh, after that, once we uh, yeah, got acquired, we had as well the opportunity to talk directly with the Office PM team, as an example, to yeah, change, for example, OneDrive and Teams as a core product to make that an per machine version and do really the things that we did as part of FS Logic right now in the core product of Office itself. So that's yeah, it's a great great momentum and a huge like different uh, a different of of how Microsoft yeah does things in the core product to make it like aligning with like virtualization scenarios like desktop virtualization scenarios. So uh, so yeah, that's since 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 that acquisition, the product really uh, yeah, started to, to consolidate and integrate in the Windows Virtual Desktop product, and now we are. are thinking as well and moving that inside the images that we uh, yeah, deliver as part of the Windows Virtual Desktop service. So, so Christian, since you're a, a past guest, uh, I'll, we're offering a special where you get one free additional minute. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask you my last question here. Uh, so when we talked last time, you were uh, you were working on a book. I think you were close to, to getting it wrapped up. Did you, did you end up finishing that? And uh, is it out there? How's it doing? Yeah, so that book uh, got released last year uh, during July timeframe, and that book, uh, yeah, collected all kinds of cloud uh, uh, like like best practices principles on on uh, yeah what the community thinks about cloud and how they design their environment. So we brought that back to a book that's released on uh, Amazon, and we uh, sold over thousand copies mm. uh, so far. So it was a huge success. We did not charge that much for it. So it was a really community-driven initiative, really to help the community to learn from others. And yeah, basically, don't yeah, just keep and stick it in your head, but 
yeah, write it down in a book and share it with others. And the book is still uh, possible to, uh, to buy uh, on Amazon. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can just look it up. Uh, great names in the community, Microsoft MVPs, uh, Citrix CTPs, VMware V experts, they are all part of that uh, book. So if you want to learn fast, quickly, and then like a bite-sized manner in for small form factor kind of contributions, that's, uh, that's probably the best book that you can buy for uh, yeah, the holiday season. So yeah, there you go. What's the title on it? It's uh, bite Size. Uh, okay. So uh, you can just look it up or just go to my blog, uh, christianbankoff.com and click on the books uh, menu option and you will find it uh, there as well. Very cool. I'm going to put that in all the stockings uh, come <laughs> Sinterklaas Day. Uh, and I, I think it's like Christmas in July time right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So well, I heard a lot all of those people... Hallmark movies, you could possibly get a book. Yeah. People were putting up trees and stuff, you know, just to kind of do something with their boredom at home. Well, I, I mean, they could do something productive like not destroy trees so so if you if, if you are uh thinking in that direction you can uh, you can just download the free ebook as well from my website so uh and just yeah look it on your ebook um on your di digital uh, like tablets and, and read it from there nice i don't think he's allowed to say kindle anymore because he works at microsoft <laughs> Look it up on your Zoom. Yeah. Uh, your Zoom reader. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the part of me wants to be like, all right. So there's a word. It rhymes with Mendel. Starts with a K. <laughs> what is it? Yeah. Go there and look it up. Uh, all right. Or, well, or, or, or do it on the new Surface New that's coming, right? Yeah. There you go. There it is. I, I was waiting for that. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we want to uh, find out a little bit more about what you've been up to uh, with Windows Virtual Desktop. So let's move now to our next segment: New Tech This Week. New tech this week, we got the scoop. All right, so Christian, uh, basically, you know, you've been there uh, a little bit now, and and it's out. But what can you tell us? What's what's new with Windows Virtual Desktop right now? Yeah, so <laughs> Windows Virtual Desktop is is now in, in, in GA since uh, September two thousand nineteen. So it's not like um, yeah that long around, uh, but there uh, have been already so many improvements and, and, and things that happened on the service to accommodate customer feedback and to make yeah, the product better in terms of yeah, simplifying the way how you deploy an environment and how you do management. So things that changed since the release of Windows for your desktop, since we moved into the next phase of the Windows for your desktop service uh, is, is something uh, that we call ARM-based, uh, which is the ARM-based model of the Azure portal. And right now, since, since the 30th of April, Windows for your desktop shifted to a non-ARM-based model to an ARM-based model. So every component that you build with the Windows for your desktop service is now possible to do directly from the Azure portal. And the great thing about that is that every component as part of your Windows for your desktop environment, your uh, workspace, which was previously known as the tenant, uh, but as well your host pools, your application groups, all those different components can now be managed and automated uh, from the Azure portal uh, directly. And previously that was all separate and, and yeah, more they are complicated to manage and as well maintain once you did the deployment. So we really simplified and brought everything together inside the Azure portal. And that's the main shift and change that we did uh, as part of uh, yeah, what we also called the, the spring uh, update of Windows for your desktop. And the main improvement was the improvement in the admin experience. And inside the admin experience, we made it as well possible to configure Azure Active Directory groups. Uh, to yeah, configure like desktop access or remote apps based on uh, groups instead of only the individual users. So that was one of the main feedback items that we received. Uh, other great things are, think about role-based uh, role access control. Uh, RBAC is now possible to consolidate and to delegate as well rights for your IT department or help desk users. We uh, consolidated as well the uh, separate PowerShell module into one AZ PowerShell module that you know from the Azure PowerShell module, uh, now called AZ.Desktop Virtualization. So we integrate into the Azure PowerShell module. Uh, so that's way easier to uh, yeah, just import modules, for example. You know, it's interesting you mentioned a lot of that stuff because one of our guys, Mike Roderick, he actually did a webinar that showed people how to get WVD set up. And it was a lot of PowerShell. You know, he was having to do a lot of things that were not not the easiest for somebody who, you know, is trying out a new technology. So it makes a lot of sense that you guys would optimize that admin interface, make it easier for people to deploy. Are you now finding that you're kind of having to get out and, and get the word out because some people may have tried it and and 
not come back or are you finding that people were just ready to go even when it was with PowerShell? Yeah, so so we have a variety of customers. Some customers are acknowledge acknowledge the uh, infrastructure as code procedure and Azure DevOps, so they really like PowerShell. But we have some customers as well that come from traditional VDI infrastructures, and they really like like uh, like an, an a GUI, like an, a management console. And we have that right now as well, directly inside. Uh, yeah, the Azure portal. So you can just search in the Azure portal for Windows Virtual Desktop and start a deployment from there all directly from the Azure portal that you know from other services inside Azure. So that's really yeah, something that we receive as feedback. Okay, um, can we do this in the Azure portal? Can we do management? Can we do help desk kind of work? Can we do like troubleshooting kind of work? And that's now all consolidated inside the Azure portal. So that's, yeah, in comparison to what we had uh, like three months back, it's it's a complete different story. You have way better user experience, admin experience. And some other great things is that we align, because of the ARM-based version, more with other services inside Azure. So think about log analytics, Azure Monitor, all those other services, Azure Sentinel, uh, the security suites, uh, Defender ATP, all those services will now work yeah, closer together because we leverage and embrace the ARM-based model more. So you will see more services inside Azure, uh, yeah, integrating with the Windows for your desktop service. So that's that's all great and, and great to see as well that this service, yeah, started as I said as part of my GBB role from 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 scratch, from basically nothing to where it is today. And all all those other services are now, uh, yeah, leveraging Windows for your desktop as well to basically do a better together story inside uh, yeah Microsoft so that's that, yeah that's a great momentum to be uh, to be part of and some other great things as part of those upgrades are that you now can change the metadata location as well so currently in the USA to different data center regions but uh, yeah in a couple of uh, months you can change it as well to West uh, Europe and as well to Asia and all those things that you that had to do via PowerShell as you said yourself like creating the tenant is no longer needed can all be done via the, uh, the, the portal and no separate consent uh, whatsoever is needed anymore. So everything can be done just by yeah, opening up the Windows for your desktop service and, and roll your host pool, your session host, and then you're basically done. And that can happen in just 30 minutes or 60 minutes or so. So really, uh, yeah. It's really awesome. Yeah. And I, I know one of the use cases that we're starting to see creep up for WVD is that if you've got a, a desktop or a laptop or whatever that has an ARM processor in it and you're trying to run x86 code, the experience isn't all that great. But if you've got a WVD that's on that 64-bit or 32-bit code, you can run them at, at native speed. So it helps us overcome the hardware limitations. Right now, are all the virtual desktops that are spun up, are they all done on the 64-bit platform or are they are they also moving over to ARM? So, so ARM is one of the initiatives internally as well that we embrace more. So we support ARM already on the client. You can run ARM. Uh, so we will, in the future, we'll bring more uh, like consumer devices to uh, to Windows for your desktop as well. So support for more ARM-based uh, devices. I already spoke yeah, very briefly about the Surface Neo. So probably most likely that will uh, integrate as well with Windows for your desktop. All to bring, like for example, desktop centralized to uh, like your your, your your tablet device or your yeah your your smartphone or whatsoever and the great thing about Windows for your desktop as you said yourself you can if you have a legacy application you can just pin it up in Azure and, and start it from uh, yeah a device that is like running on a different operating system like Mac as an example or a Linux thing client and that creates a very different yeah way of how we did it because you have the simplicity of the service that's already pre-created and we yeah, we manage and maintain the Windows Virtual Desktop service for you. And you are in charge of, yeah, uh, simplifying how you do application management because of the uh, yeah, service that you can centralize, manage as part of your Azure subscription. And another great thing that we uh, that we released uh, in a public preview that will go very, very quick, uh, quickly from uh, from now in, uh, in a, in a uh, GA generally available status is the MSIX App Attach uh, yeah, application feature. And that's a new feature, how we do application delivery within a Windows for desktop in the near future. And with that service, we can uh, take advantage of MSIX, which is an application virtualization technology, it's part of Microsoft. And with AppAttach, we put that virtual application inside a virtual hard drive in a container, and we can 
assign an application to a virtual machine separately from the machine itself. So that leaves us in a better position to do image management, as an example. Very simplified because you separate the uh, management of the uh, applications. You can update an application, for example, without touching the image. So without rebooting or opening up the image. So you simplify how you do image management yeah, with, uh, with MSX Appletech. So that's coming very soon as well. And that will consolidate as well inside that Azure portal experience. So I've heard a lot about PowerShell, uh, just out of curiosity. Can I use the, the Azure CLI, right, the, the Python-based one, to provision Windows Virtual Desktop? Or, or am I married to PowerShell or the Azure portal? Yeah, so everything works via PowerShell. Uh, ARM templates are coming very soon for the new uh, management portal. For the uh, yeah, the old base or uh, non-ARM based version, you still have ARM. Uh, but it's Azure CLI is not possible to, uh, to use, uh, not yet. But that's good Speak feedback, by the way. Speaking of which, that brings up my second question. <laughs> you said ARM templates. ARM is such a loaded acronym. Are, is Microsoft going to change ARM for, from, you know, for the Azure Resource Manager to something else? Because I have a real hard time keeping that straight between Azure Resource Manager and was it Advanced Risk Machine Instruction Set? Yeah, we, Does anybody else have trouble with that? <laughs> we get that question more, especially from yeah, people that are not very familiar with Azure and they hear, they, they hear ARM for the first time and they think, okay, I, I know ARM for my, uh, for my mobile device. Is this the same? Uh, so, so, so yeah, I, I definitely hear that more often, but there are no plans to uh, yeah, to change that name or whatsoever uh, as of yet. So, uh, but that's good feedback. I want to thank well, you for sharing it with the team. Yeah, thank you for asking that, Justin, because as the tech noob of the group, I was like, oh, the, the arm chips. <laughs> so, so uh, don't feel bad, Peter. There was a couple of times because we've been ta we've been repeat reporting on like arm transitions and stuff for a variety of companies yeah. and uh, over the last few weeks, and it took me a minute. He was like, you can provision this with arm, and I was like. Uh huh. So you can put it on small, power efficient. Wait a minute. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about Azure Resource Manager. So, uh, but then he lost me at PowerShell. So, <laughs> uh, hey. So, uh, in, in terms of what's coming up for you now, Christian, I, I know uh, Microsoft has moved everything to uh, virtual events instead of uh, in-person things. And, and you actually had a, a, an event recently that, that moved to virtual that got a lot of people <laughs> at it, which was great. More people than you probably could have uh, had if it, it had been in-house. But uh, what else is coming up for you right now? Any any events down the road? Yes, yeah, so, um, so, I'm, so we are internally working towards like Inspire, uh, Microsoft Ready, which is virtual as well, which normally is in Las, Las Vegas. Uh, but that's, um, yeah, not, not something like uh, I'm, I'm very um, active in. So the next big event with what I'm organizing and where I'm pretty involved is, is the next Microsoft Meets Community event, the community event that you just called out, which was very popular because of the, uh, yeah, making it from physical to virtual because of COVID-19. So that's coming up as well. Uh, most likely uh, like uh, the last week of September after the virtual Ignite event. Uh, so we are preparing for that as well. Uh, so just to uh, yeah, not saying saying that much because yeah, everything what I'm uh, what I'm saying about this uh, would be NDA. But uh, in inside Microsoft, we are thinking as well and uh, making uh, yeah or taking Windows Virtual Desktop to the next phase and uh, yeah, bringing Windows Virtual Desktop even more easier as I just explained to uh, to customers. So that's something you will hear more during uh, during Ignite in September, uh, virtual Ignite. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, Windows for your desktop, and if you are, um, yeah, if you if you really think this is this is this is the product that I would like to use, what a lot of customers of, of us uh, think as well, uh, we are even making it more simplified uh, in terms of yeah deploying it uh, in the future. So uh, yeah, just uh, just stay tuned for Ignite. So that is one of the big events that is coming where I'm focused on as well. And yeah, besides that, we. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we keep investing in other like events, community events. We just did a uh, very large uh, digital disrupt event from uh, a great partner of us, Agile, that delivered a uh, Think Client technology, the operating system to run Windows Virtual Desktop on uh, on a uh, Linux Think Client operating system. So um, yeah, if you, if you want to stay in touch or want to see me speak on like let's say MZX Appetite or in conjunction with WVD. Yeah, you can just look uh, look up my website. I have a separate section on events there as well. So uh, maybe it's good to, good to follow up uh, 
to that location. Yeah, I'll make sure we put that uh, link in the description, uh, especially on the, the, the video we put here on, on YouTube. And if you're watching else, elsewhere, it's christianbrinkoff.com. Uh, and I think any time that there's a, a, an event that's virtual that was originally supposed to be in Las Vegas, everyone should still have to come hungover and very tired uh, when they come to the keynotes, just <laughs> and, to make it more authentic. And, and fully shamed. Like, yeah. you gotta have that shame look on your face. You're like, I'm real sorry that I- Yeah, I, I know I did something wrong. I don't know what it was yeah. exactly, but yeah. I've embarrassed myself so, and my company. So, so where you guys planned as well to go to uh, to that event? I know we, you have a stand at Ignite normally, but- Yeah, Ignite uh, normally is the one we've done, but well, recently that's been just down the road from us in, in Orlando. We're up in, in Gainesville, Florida, um, but that was moving, that was, New Orleans was that supposed to be this year? I think. Yeah, New Orleans. Yeah, so which is still relatively close to us, but Ignite seems to be um, the best bang for for our buck. But we we have uh, we've done a few of the Ignite um, uh, tour events because uh, we we actually have an office over in the UK. So we did London, and, and we're actually looking at, at Amsterdam once. So maybe uh, when that rolls back around again, we'll be able to to connect with you over there. But uh, I volunteer for that one. You, you got that? Okay. I mean, we could send the people that are in the office there, but... Uh, or, or, or... Or, and bear with me. Or yeah. me. Just floating this one out there, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, let, you, let, me, let me draw a name out of my hat. Ooh, Justin Dennison. If you could, yeah, you could make a report uh, about why you should go. I, I would love to see Justin in Amsterdam with the pickle so, so, herring. Do I have to wear a tweed jacket, like a bow tie, to give my report in front of everybody? Yes, you should. Okay. Yeah. Every employee has to write three paragraphs on why they think they should be the most appropriate person to go to Amsterdam. I'm just going to write why I don't think Justin should go. That'll be my, my paper. Is it? You know you can't trust him. Here's how Justin can embarrass us internationally. Right now, it's been focused domestic. If that was really a concern, you wouldn't have me on video. That's true, yeah. Wait, this podcast goes out internationally? Uh-oh. Oh, no. Thought the firewall took care of that. Hey, Christian, thank you so much for coming back on and, uh, and yeah. bringing us up to speed. And congratulations on the, on the job move. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, it was, was, again, a great pleasure to be on the show. And uh, let's uh, re- do this we are currently like uh, maybe every six months or so. Yeah, I don't know if we've had anyone on three times yet. Now, we've had a few people twice, so we'll see uh, if we can break a record. And it could be like... Yeah, let's, uh, let's make that happen. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Like Saturday Night Live. After three you, timers jacket. You know, five <laughs> times you get the jacket and we can do the same thing oh, kind of here. And that'd be great. So, what, yes, what's okay. the green jacket for? It's the Masters yeah, golf tournament. These, you just have to win the match or do you have to win? You have to win. You have to yeah. win. Okay. You don't just show up. Well, no. I mean, you obviously to, you don't just show up. You can go to Men's Warehouse as well. I kind of I <laughs> wanted to see him do the Shooter McGavin. Oh, but, yeah. 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 I, I don't know if those movies have, have made it to the Netherlands yet. Hopefully. I, I, <laughs> well, let's find out. Have you have you seen Happy Gilmore? Did did that make it over there? Yeah, Adam Sandler. Yeah, that, yeah, it did make it. But uh, uh, Chuck Norris is probably uh, sure. one that uh, resonates oh. a lot here. So yeah, he, uh, I mean, Norris. Chuck Norris jokes. He's our great oh, ambassador. No, I'm, not I'm afraid for. not to. Like, like, yeah, I watched that movie, Chuck. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Christian, for joining us. And uh, everyone stay tuned. We're going to uh, take a quick break. and We're going to be back with some news right after this on Technado with Don Pazette. The IT Pro TV app is available for iOS and tvOS. The modern user interface makes navigation easy. Recently watched videos can be found on the home screen, as well as our daily live streams. Choose landscape mode for larger viewing. Access the entire course library by clicking on the play icon. Navigate our content by category, certification, and job role. Learn where you want and when you want as a premium annual member by downloading episodes for offline viewing. Watch on the go and pick up later on any of your favorite devices. So head to the App Store and download the IT Pro TV app. All right, welcome back to TechNado with Don Pazette, and thank you to Christian for joining us. Uh, but we've definitely got a lot of news to get to, so let's go ahead and jump right in uh, with our first article here, which is on Tom's Hardware. Huawei-powered desktop PC tested. 8-core, 7-nanometer Kunpeng 920 processor, which is mouthful. really what I was looking for. <laughs> you nailed it. Not all cores are created equal, it says. Uh, so is this, is this Huawei's kind of 
foray into the desktop PC market? Because, you know, when I think of them, I think about phones and antennas and things like that. And spy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's two different things at work here. Uh, one piece is that this is a ARM-powered system coming out. We've been talking about that a lot because of Apple's decision to move to the ARM uh, processors for their systems. So we're seeing Huawei do the same. And then the other part is it is Huawei moving into that desktop market. Now, in this case, notice how they say it's a Huawei-powered desktop. So they're not actually making the desktop, they're making the chip. And there's a third-party provider who's actually making the desktop for it. But it's uh, another part of China's push to not rely on Western companies to provide their silicon. So they want to get away from using U.S. technologies and U.S. companies. So now they've got a homegrown solution. They can use their own processors. Now, this first outing was uh, purchased by a group whose name I can't remember, but they did a little bit of benchmarking and filmed a video of how to use it. It's all in Chinese. Yeah, it's a Chinese YouTube channel, and then it has the Chinese characters, so yeah. that's why you don't remember them, because <laughs> you don't speak Mandarin. But then, yeah, yeah, I have no clue. But in there, you do find out the device, was, it was actually pretty expensive. It was over $1,000 for, uh, for the system, and then it performed pretty poorly as far as you know running any of the traditional stuff so as far as like a light web browser type system it worked fine which would kind of put it in line with a chromebook but at a thousand us dollars that's like way more than you should be paying for a chromebook but it does show that that uh, whole technology is pro progressing really fast and we're going to start seeing a lot more of those arm processors on the market so so it's not running windows it's running a proprietary uh linux distribution? yeah it's a linux variant that they've done because they you know they they have a motherboard with a certain set of hardware, and they've got to compile the OS for it. So obviously they can't do Windows, and so they're just kind of left with Linux at that point, unless they want to roll their own. And it's Chinese Linux, right? Is this, like, would that play into this? Like, would they have to compile that specifically for selling that in that area? Yeah, it says trying a, to get away, or? a China-produced 64-bit UOS operating system. It's largely a modified flavor of Linux. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's several distros that do that, that build for the Chinese market, because, you know, the Chinese character set is so different than what we use, the Latin character set, that it, it kind of makes sense to have a distro that is built for that language specifically. So that, that's not that unusual. But being built for an ARM processor to run in a desktop PC format, that's what makes this unusual. For that money, given that like the the run, that almost sounds like was it the Pixel Book that was like the high end Chromebook? Yeah, provided like fourteen hundred dollars. Yeah, and they're like, you can browse the web amazingly. <laughs> yeah, and the the number one customer was Google. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were using it internally like crazy. Yeah, how much is the wheel kit for this? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I want to know. Well, it is a still a, probably a better deal there, but. Uh, but it, it does highlight the warning. You know, two weeks ago, we reported on an Apple switching over, or three weeks now, uh, and I said that ARM performance is going to be something we got to watch out for. It's, you know, not on par with what we're used to. And then Apple put out some benchmarks that made it look like, yeah, they can, they can really make that up. But now we're seeing that other people outside of Apple are not getting those same gains. So we'll have to watch and see. I don't think we're all going to have ARM desktops in the next two years. So all I could think about when I read this article, like when I... I saw, you know, eight core arm. I was like, this is a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> like, for some reason, that's all my mind was putting. It was a tiny little, like, Intel NUC. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Well, the performance they were talking about is actually in line with a Raspberry Pi. So yeah. that's, I think, a good analogy, but those cost $45. Yeah. <laughs> and if you really want to turn up the WIC, $65. And what they say on this one, it's 1060 roughly, is what they, they purchased it for. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd I'd go uh, two, three, six Raspberry Pis. Yeah. But it does have a you know it has a 256 gig hard drive, uh, so it's got a lot of storage. It has M2 slots, PCIe 4. Uh, it has a Yeston RX 550 graphics. Which when I saw that, I I don't know is that a uh, an AMD RX 550 like an ATI but under the Yeston brand, or is this Yeston's own thing? They didn't really clarify on that. So it does have a higher end graphics adapter, and and so it in theory, might do better in some scenarios, but when the software is so young as it is right now, we just don't see that because there's not a lot of software to test. And and didn't they say even though it touts that it has PCIe 4, or PCI 4, like there's no actual connectors or anything like that? Did I, <laughs> I read did that, that right? Yeah, it has PCIe 4 support, but only PCIe 3 slots. Ah. Oh. Now, is so much of the uh, computing power just dedicated to sending your information to the government in, in this case? Is that why you're not maybe seeing the gains yourself? There's an extra core for that. Oh, it's a separate, okay. That's for the eight cores job. 
Yeah. There's a Rest Pi actually attached in the yeah. back. Like, where's that connected? Yeah. One for each governmental agency. Yeah. This is the CIA core. This is the NSA core. <laughs> oh, I figured it just went straight to China in this case. Well, I was thinking about the domestic, the ones that get launched here in the U.S. Oh, okay. So Got to yeah. localize. Yeah. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure the Pentagon is buying up a whole slew of these right now. Uh, all right, let's move over to our next article over at endgadget.com. Discord is rebranding to shift away from gaming. The company says it wants to be more inclusive to all of its users. And I'm going to be honest with you. I've, I've never used Discord, and I remember you guys were having a discussion uh, amongst your team here at the, at the company talking about, hey, do we want to use Slack or Discord for something? And I'm like, I've, I have no idea. Is, is Discord just a... It's it's more than just messaging, right? So it's it's similar to Slack and Teams and other apps that it it is first and foremost a chat platform that you can chat back and forth, you can chat by text, or you can do audio, and now you can do video. You can also do screen sharing. And the main thing about it is that it's basically free for most people, and you can spin up your own private server, again, for free, and kind of control who has access to have private conversations. So it's a great platform. It's very reminiscent of IRC, and the way that it worked, like the old EF net and all those guys. So that model, they, they basically started that focused on gamers. And so if you were a video gamer and you were trying to coordinate a squad in Call of Duty or something like that, you'd use Discord. Uh, and that was kind of how they gained their popularity. But in recent years, they've been used for all sorts of different things. Now, I'll say that I use Discord every single day, but not for gaming stuff. You know, there's various, like the the ISC Squared group has a whole study group inside of Discord. And there's several software programs I use where their tech support is done through Discord. And uh, and I have a, a group of friends that I talk to and we do it through Discord. And so, it's just a web interface? Um, or, or you can download a, a client as well? Yeah, they have native apps, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, and uh, the mobile devices, iOS, Android. So, you know, they got really good coverage and the price is right for most people. And so they are shifting to now say, hey, we're not just focused on gaming anymore. We're now going to focus on communication in general, which now makes them a direct competitor to Slack and Teams. And uh, and I'm interested to see where that goes because it is a good platform. I, like I said, I use it myself. Hmm. How's the GIF support? <laughs> Total GIF support. Ooh. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's made for ga- It was started by gamers. Yeah, so it's got to be. So not only does it have GIF support, it has GIF support that will destroy your self-esteem. Yeah. <laughs> And huh. custom emojis, which yeah. is really important. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can put in all sorts of emojis. Yeah. You are talking my language. Really valuable Good, stuff. <laughs> Goodbye, teams. Now, I, I did have a question for you, Peter, because, you know, you work in marketing. I do. Uh, they're <laughs> saying it's a rebranding, but they're not changing their name or their logo. They're just changing their purpose. So is that actually a rebrand? Isn't there a different term for that? Um, <laughs> I mean, it sounds more like a repositioning. Like, if... You know, like I said, I don't know much about them, but I'm not in either of those really target markets that that they're in right now. So I'm curious to see if I'll start seeing ads now targeted to me in the places that that I'm uh, communicating and stuff. So, uh, yeah, because I, you know I'm not in the gaming community, so I'm not really seeing it right now. But you're right, yeah, it's, that wouldn't be really a rebrand unless they were you know doing a whole new color scheme logo. Uh, could be a new tagline. It is your place to talk. There. Uh, their old one or that sounds like a sprint next tail tag yeah that might be a new thing i did think it was interesting that a few years back they raised 150 million dollars in funding and they used that to launch a gaming storefront (laughs) and the gaming storefront failed people didn't use it and so they ended up shutting that down uh this time around they've just gathered another 100 million dollars in funding at a uh, valuation between three billion and four billion dollars where the hell are these people getting this (laughs) money You said it's free. It's yeah. Free. yeah. Now, you can pay a little extra. And actually, I, I, just to, to clarify here, I, I pay, I think, $10 a month uh, because you can get, instead of 64 kilobit audio, you can go up to 128 kilobit audio and, and, and things like that. So there are things you can pay extra for, but you don't have to. It works perfectly fine for free. That, just, can you set up a server for free? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I just, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the math in my like, head, going, all right. Like, so how many dons? This is kind of like when I heard about Medium raising all that money, and then they didn't have monetization platform. If there's one thing Silicon Valley has taught us is that companies don't actually have to make money; <laughs> they just have to sound cool. And the cooler you sound, the higher your valuation. Oh, we work. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's quite the valuation, though. Between three and four billion dollars. I mean, there's a 
bit of wiggle room in the middle there. <laughs> at that point, well, you're just you're just talking that, about they're just numbers at that point. So, so question: If somebody came along, do you think they would be like, "No, we're not going to sell"? I tell you what: <laughs> If I was giving away a product, and someone's like, "We'll give you three billion dollars for it," I'm like, "Yeah, you will. I'll see y'all later." Yeah, the first thing Discord ever sold was itself. Yeah, three billion dollars. <laughs> Well, that was, that was Twitter, right? Twitter was yeah. super valuable for a long time. People were making them offers. They turned down a billion-dollar offer. They said, no, we'll do it ourselves. And then they had their whole debacle where they, they were trying to find a buyer. Disney was lined up to buy. Uh, and by the time it was done, Disney's offer dropped all the way down to $400 million. Mm -hmm. And then finally they just said, no, nah, actually, we're not interested. And that was it. And so the Twitter can't even sell itself anymore. So they've got to be kicking themselves in the butt over that one. They, they ended up having like crazy turmoil with like their board and like their CEO during, Still CEO do. over, yeah. during that time. And like that continues. Yeah. Very reminiscent of like Yahoo. Didn't they, would they get an offer for a couple billion or like four billion from Microsoft or something? And then ended up selling for like 35 bucks and a yeah. Yeah. yeah, and an old stock. ham sandwich. <laughs> and the ham sandwich was more valuable. Yeah, yeah. Like I do. <laughs> the only reason I gave them $35 is a ham sandwich, top of the line. <laughs> Between right. three and $4 billion, oddly enough. Yeah. yeah, of course, if it's a San Francisco ham sandwich. <laughs> That's true. All right, over at TheVerge.com is our next article. With Edge, Microsoft's forced Windows updates just sank to a new low. It undermines Microsoft's own argument that automatic updates are critical. So I'm, I'm guessing they uh, just snuck Edge to be everyone's default browser at that point. All right, am I, am I the only Windows user on the show right now? Uh, Ron? Uh, you are, but I, I'll give you this. The way this article is written, the tone, I don't know. There was, for some reason, it, it calls like little alarms in my head. That it was like, I feel like there's more to this story. Well, you know, it, it's The Verge, so it's sensationalized, definitely. <laughs> but um, as a Windows user, I can tell you on my on my computer at home, when actually it didn't happen on my computer here at work because I dual boot Linux most of the time. Um, but on my computer at home, uh, wake up one morning, go log into the computer, and I see a Microsoft Edge icon on my desktop. Microsoft Edge pinned to my taskbar. Yeah. And when I clicked on an email link, it asked me if I wanted to make Edge my default browser and was telling me about how great Edge was. And there was a notification in the bottom right corner about Edge. So it was a huge push to convert people over to Edge. Now, I did something crazy and clicked on no. And then it was fine, right? I did have to unpin it from my taskbar because that was annoying. Um, but otherwise, uh, that was it. So, so it's two the, clicks. It's not the end of the world, but there's a lot of people who are up in arms over this saying, look, Microsoft got sued for anti-competitive practices right. uh, in the EU, and that's why they had to release the whole Windows 2000N, you know, the, the versions that didn't include Internet Explorer or Windows Media Player. And that was specifically because of their browser as well at that point. Yeah, too. yeah. and that introduced that feature where when you installed Windows, you get a pop-up that say, which browser would you like? And it had to list all these different browsers that you could pick from. Uh, and so Microsoft is basically going back to the old way of saying, no, we're, we're going to give you a browser you're going to have it, you're going to like it, and you can still switch if you want, which really, I think, just sets them up to get sued again. Or, if you really want to sue someone, it's technically Google's browser. So, go after them. Mm. Yeah, how can that be antitrust? Mm. I don't well, know. I think the the account sync and all that stuff is still tied to a Microsoft account, yeah, so Microsoft yeah. gets to harvest your data first, and Google gets the uh, leftovers. Well, I just figure they're all putting it in the same place. I have been China. Seeing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so when I when I read the headline initially, I was like, "Man, they installed Edge and then it uninstalled all the other browsers." Oh yeah, it didn't do that. Yeah. No. So that I would have been like, "Okay, I'd have been upset about that." But if you click no and then you unpinned it and then that's that, right, Don? Yeah. I mean, that's basically it. Now, now I do still have this new Edge installed, but I don't care about that. I had the old Edge installed before. Yeah. Um, so I just ignore it like I ignore the old well, ones. So Wait, this how? says, did you mention that, uh, did I mention as of this update, you can't install, uninstall Edge anymore. So you, you can't get rid of it even if you want to? You know, I saw that, but I haven't verified it yet. And uh, so I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. But again, you've got a version of Edge no matter what in right. Windows. It installs by default. So whether it's a new one or the old one doesn't matter if you're ignoring it. Uh, that, that was the <laughs> Uh, that was the little tagline that I went, oh, are these really computer users? Because I remember running Windows, I think 98 and, uh, you know, ME and all, all those. I remember trying to uninstall Internet Explorer because I hated it. Uh, and it will mess up your computer pretty bad at that time because it was highly integrated with um, Windows File Explorer. Mm -hmm. um, is yeah. that true of Edge now? No, they, they had to split it apart. Yeah, so that was back, uh, as far as back as like Windows 98 right. with the whole, was it Memphis or, or whatever they were calling it, where 
your your whole desktop and all that was being rendered by the browser, and then they split that up after the big lawsuit. So you have the explorer process and the i explore process. So they are separated. Uh, so it's not it's not like part and parcel anymore. Okay. So so what is worse, uh, Microsoft forcing uh, this on everyone uh, that runs Windows, or when Apple pushed out that U two album to everyone that uh, has Ooh. an iPhone? YouTube <laughs> album. YouTube yeah. album, absolutely. Yeah. Absolute garbage. So my truck auto plays random stuff on my phone <laughs> every time I get in. If it's, if I'm not already like playing an audio yeah. book or something, the YouTube album cycles through. I can't get rid of it. It's like, well, I can't say what it's <laughs> You know, I, I wouldn't have minded the YouTube album so much if it wasn't for that whole awkward stage interaction they had. <laughs> it was just so bizarre. The, oh, you the, listened the finger to it? touch <laughs> and stuff. Well, no, didn't didn't you watch the Apple announcement? Oh, yeah. yeah you yeah. mean ET phone home finger touch? It yeah. was just weird. It was creepy and Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> Elliot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyhow. Also, the album wasn't good. Yeah, that's more. <laughs> yeah. More in mind. <laughs> I mean, if they'd have given me like Joshua Tree, I'd be like, "Yes, this is awesome." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> good story. <laughs> ah, Peter, you ask a question, I answer the question. You're like, "Oh, why'd you answer that question, Justin?" Because you answered the flip. You asked a flip question. You, you went on really far with that. I, I asked a, an either-or question. And yeah, and I gave you talking about Joshua. my answer and justification, which is how <laughs> questions should work. Well, we had to be careful because you brought up the Joshua Tree album, and we all know that's like a special thing that we can't deface in any way. So yeah. Absolutely. Now we got to pick and choose our words. All of you guys did your uh, Spotify playlist uh, like a year or so back for uh, around around Christmas time. I think we. I don't think I had any U two on mine, did I? No, I don't think so. Mine was like a weird mix of like bluegrass country and like death metal. (laughs) Yeah. Ronnie's was Ronnie's was all Abba. Actually, a little bit of hip hop. I do like Abba. Yeah. Who doesn't? Yeah. Uh, Was Ronnie's playlist all ABBA? No, I'm making that up. Seventy percent. I don't remember. So yeah, roughly seventy. And the rest was Enya. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was all and Scandinavian. That's all Only bands with four letters in the name. Yeah, and a an umlaut. Yeah, Dido, <laughs> tattoo. Yeah. All right. Next up, over at Wired.com, new Mac ransomware is even more sinister than it appears. <laughs> The malware known as ThiefQuest or EvilQuest also has spyware capabilities that allow it to grab passwords and credit card numbers. This is this is frightening. Uh, first off, <laughs> let me let me just interject here. Don't name malware like it's a web cartoon. Um, yeah, it does sound like because I was like, oh, Dan Harmon's got a new cartoon, EvilQuest. But it is apparently a bad thing, right? Is this season two of Thief they, Quest? They did have to rename it because originally it was called Evil Quest. Right. And then they found out there's a video game called Evil Quest. See? that they, I guess they liked it or something. So they said, oh, let's change it to Thief Quest instead. So, But who changed it? The, the people who the, discovered it. Yeah, okay. Uh, the, CDE like the hackers? Like, yeah, we want to put out, we're going to yeah. re, re put out our... Sorry, numbers. guys. Don't call us this. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so this malware was discovered. It, it is unusual, uncommon, to find malware on a map. But we know it's out there. We've reported it here on Technado before. Uh, this one's pretty bad, right? So it, it's got a ransomware component, but it also has a whole remote administration toolkit built into it. If you get this malware, hackers have complete and total access to your system and your information. They can use it to springboard. Uh, it's a it's a feature-packed malware package. So this is like a real advancement. But the <laughs> one thing you don't have to worry about is getting this one by accident. You pretty much have to get this one uh, on purpose. And, and let me clarify that by saying what I mean. Um, this is being distributed right now in BitTorrents of bootleg software. Yeah. So if you want to get Adobe Photoshop, but you don't want to pay Adobe for it, and you go to a BitTorrent and download and install a bootleg copy there's a good chance that you'll find the ThiefQuest malware packaged in there. So when you install it, obviously you have to be an administrator to install software, you're now installing the malware with administrative privileges and your machine is infected. Once your machine is infected, it is in there. This thing gets in, it gets its hooks in deep. And so at that point, you can't trust your system anymore. You'll need to format and restore from a time machine backup unless your time machine backup was attached to your system when you were infected, (laughs) in which case you're screwed and... uh, you know, you just set the format. Yeah, so, I got this when I uh, when I downloaded a bootlegged uh, Microsoft Edge. Yep. <laughs> it sounds yeah. a little bit like measles. Aren't they supposed to release an Edge for uh, Mac OS? I, th- I think they were I talking did, about like yeah. cross platform because it's now Chromium based and probably specifically to support this malware. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm, man, that would be an interesting like like 
and I present Exhibit A. Linux now has this weird thief <laughs> best malware because Microsoft Edge was installed. Uh, and it is actually, it's been available for quite some time. Um, that Mac, uh, Microsoft Edge for Mac OS is available, yes. Yeah, I've been seeing pop-ups for it, so. Uh, it hasn't installed by default yet. No, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if they can figure that out. <laughs> Maybe if you do the I, ransomware, then hmm. all of a sudden you'll have that. But what, what's worse, having um, having Thief Quest or having the U2 album? <laughs> That's our oh, new test. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I'm still going. So I feel like they both stole something from me. So, <laughs> uh, like important storage space. My freedom. The YouTube album was harder to get off. <laughs> I, I ran a scan. I, on I'm going to be honest with you. Get it off. The YouTube al YouTube album. YouTube. YouTube album. It, I mean, there should be a vaccine for that one. I mean, I, just can't, <laughs> I can't get rid of it either. Every time I delete it, every time my phone reboots or updates, it's like, well, here we go again. So, uh, bring it back. true story. You can't remove the album. Uh, you actually have to open a support ticket with Apple. And at <laughs> one point, there was a class action suit against them. And they made a special portal to remove the U2 album. And you could go and fill out the form, but it was basically a support ticket. <laughs> and I'm, I'm trying to see if it's still active. Uh, I could just see headlines saying, you know, class action suit to remove YouTube album. And that's, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, what are the punitive damages that yeah. I can associate with this? They've got to be pretty high. Well, yeah, so they've got iTunes.com forward slash SOI dash remove. And that's the special landing page you can go to get the U2 album removed from your Apple account. <laughs> hmm. So it, it is worse than Thief I, Quest. I can't take Man. away the memories, though. I wonder what it's like to have that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, hey, listen, listen, we're going to push a musical album to everybody. Is it good? Shut up. It's good. <laughs> right? And then, and then it's going to be great. They don't like it? Oh, we should probably set up a specialty portal so they can remove it. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> With oh, iTunes. Discontinue I just went to the iTunes. Page. The page is offline. Yeah. Down? Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, the page is offline. So Fake I'm news. Sorry, guys. Forever? Now, Don, I, I was looking at the, the rest of this article here. It says, the malware does include some obfuscation feature to help it hide out. The malware won't run if it detects certain security tools, like Norton Antivirus. So if you have antivirus, huh. it's just not going to run? Does that sound... Yeah. Okay. So, okay. I mean, so it, it will run. There's there's times on the system when the antivirus hasn't started yet. Right. And Ronnie, you and I have seen this with mm -hmm. like the Sophos software that we roll out. We get right. alerts all the time about the antivirus stopping. Um, so there's times when it can execute. So it's just trying to hide itself. It knows that if it executes, then it's going to be detected. So it's just trying to hide. Uh, there's a couple of different malware packages that do that. Mm. And I should uh, just, uh, as an aside, real quick, you mentioned someone mentioned we should have a vaccine. Um, I think for the U2 album or this virus, I can't remember which one it was, but uh, I should mention uh, after our Bill Gates uh, vaccine discussion last week, our YouTube comments got a little interesting. Uh, had to really? Do some, yeah. Oh. Had to do some filtering there. It, uh, oh. There was, like, was, there was some misinformation. No, there was a lot of misinformation about oh. That was our tinfoil hat article, yes, right, about the microchip? And, and I don't think they got the joke. Um, <laughs> the, they, they the didn't. commenters that... Oh, man. You know, it was a bunch of Alex Jones watchers. They should just yeah. shuffle so right on over here. were they in support of the chip or against the chip? Well, it, it was, why are, why are uh, we talking about this guy who's given polio to half of India? <laughs> oh. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'll yeah. send you the articles. Man, I bet <laughs> they hate Jimmy Carter, too. It's a good read. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Like peanut allergies? No, uh, so the Carter Foundation has like done a lot of work to get rid of like diseases that were treatable. There's this one called the fireworm, and it infects water supplies. And once it gets into its adult stage, it like pokes its little head out of your uh, out of your foot. And when you step I didn't know in where water, he's going, yeah, he's yeah. pointing yeah. down. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, foot. And so when you step into water, it releases like um, like babies. We'll just huh. call them. That. We'll simplify it. And then to get it out of your leg, they have to they have to like hold you down and just wrap it slowly around a stick and pull it out of you. Remember that scene from The Cell where he like cuts that person open and <laughs> is like reeling up their, uh, their intestines on And that? Jimmy Carter does that to people? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like that, but it's for a parasite. It is almost eliminated, like from existence. And it's called the fireworm? Yeah, I think it's called the fireworm, yeah. Mm, look hold on, I'll tell you. Uh, and while I'm at it, I might delete the U2 album to see if it comes back. It's like the Firefest. 
<laughs> equally as disturbing. Yeah. Is it spelled F Y R E? Now, now we're all we're all googling. You can hear our keyboards at work. They give you a cheese sandwich. Tell us more about this fireworm. <laughs> yeah. Y'all yeah, right. go ahead with the next article. Okay, I'll, I'll start on that. Yeah. So we'll we'll pick you back up in a minute, uh, there, Justin. <laughs> all right. Our next article is over at slashdot.org. Former Yahoo engineer who infiltrated six thousand accounts avoids jail. So this is a guy on the inside uh, targeting Yahoo accounts. Then I saw this article and I thought, man, I know Peter loves it when we report on uh, you know hackers that uh, get their come up and, yeah. and and get sentenced. Uh, so in this case, he got sentenced, but like the lightest sentence possible. Uh, so this guy was a Yahoo engineer, and while he was working at the company, he used his administrative access to open up over 6,000 accounts and looking at their email, looking at their files. And his goal was to find uh, nudie pics, basically. He was looking for people's uh, personal photos uh, for his own um, purposes. So not for not for blackmail purposes, uh, but he, for uh, his personal uh, enjoyment? He didn't blackmail or distribute. He just stored them. They say he pulled like almost two terabytes of, of data out From of these 6, accounts. 6,000 accounts? Yeah. Two terabytes of nudie pics? Yeah, that's because no one checks their Yahoo mail. <laughs> so well, if it's full of nudie pics, that was from it. one account. <laughs> <laughs> that's a new marketing angle right there. Yeah. Do you know how much nudity could be in your Yahoo account? Go check it out now. <laughs> yeah. You better log in. Make sure you use this portal. This yeah. looks like a phishing page. No, it's not. Uh, it's, it's worth the risk. Yeah. Nudie pics. Huh? So apparently, uh, uh, he. With the charges that were put against him, he could have had up to five years in prison and a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine. Uh, instead, he was given five years of what amounts to house arrest mm -hmm. and a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar fine in uh, restitution. House so. arrest during a quarantine is really dumb. Yeah. I mean, well, it's kind of cheating. Let's also roll back to the fact that he broke the law, uh -huh. <laughs> lost his job. Granted, it was at Yahoo. <laughs> by perusing, they did him a favor. <laughs> yeah, by perusing people's personal information, looking for nudie pics. Last time I checked, one of the freest commodities on the internet is pornography. It's true. Why but am so I going to risk satisfying. going to prison? It's so, so much more satisfying when you find it yourself. I assume. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Allegedly. Oh uh, man, that well, like, stuff like, I'm like that just doesn't this. make sense to me. <laughs> well, his leniency, according to his lawyers, is because he admitted to destroying the hard drives. Huh. Uh, so, you know, when the FBI raided his home, he, he destroyed the hard drives. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely admit to that as well. Don't they call that uh, 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 obstruction evidence? Evidence? <laughs> yeah, tampering with evidence? Yeah, that's right, because if you do that in other times, right, what's the saying, a misdemeanor becomes a felony? Yeah. Well, his lawyers also say, you know, he, uh, he did this only for self-gratification. He didn't share them online, so he's okay. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that's how mm -hmm. Peep and Tom's work also. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe it's more of an illness then. I only murder for self gratification. <laughs> yeah. I don't. Uh, yeah. I don't share it with yeah, others. I'd, I'd take no other pleasure in it other than the personal pleasure that I derive from snuffing out someone's eye. See, I like <laughs> those good judges that do the fun, you know, things like you have to hold a sign or something saying you did. Like, <laughs> I would like for him for the rest of his life, all his email accounts, everyone gets the password to. You know, the ultimate sentence for him would be forcing him to use Yahoo the rest of his life. <laughs> or forcing him to get rid of all the junk mail manually That in Yahoo. Now, mail. That's why they added the cruel and unusual punishment uh, <laughs> disclaimer. He's like, I'll take the fire and The founding fathers saw Yahoo coming. <laughs> yeah. said, no, we've got to. Uh, by the way, I do want to backtrack and yeah, clarify. <laughs> it is not the fire worm. Sometimes it's used colloquially, apparently, because it feels like fire. It's called the guinea worm. The guinea worm. The bearded fire worm's a whole other thing. Is that is that a uh, a nod to where it's located? Where uh, so <laughs> the country? Um, yeah, uh, kind of. Or is it so it was pigs? has it's in Asia and Africa, and in 1986, the year I was born, mm -hmm. uh, 3.5 million cases of guinea worm. No coincidence. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so recently, um, in 2015, there was only 22 cases. Wow. Yeah. Uh, a fun, fast tip for you guys. Do not Google 
fire worm removal. <laughs> I just did it, and I think I'm damaged now. Oh. See, Justin got me to Google bestiality, and he got you to Google. It, but I was right in the spell, right. it wasn't I? No, Actually, you were right. I, I typed guinea worm, and then removal auto-completed for mm. me. I'm like, all right, and then... Isn't it horrible? It's horrible. Yeah. Yes. So how long are we talking about here? I, so, too long. I, 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 I want to say it second. takes... At least a couple of hours. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, length of, of worm. Are we talking Uh Well, that's feet, a good question. Let's, let's, meters. Let's, oh, meters. Ooh. Inches. Uh, let's see here. Um, Kenny worm. You got Up seconds. to 31 inches. 31 inches. Okay. Uh, it is a nematode. Mm. Oh, what does that mean? A single cell. Uh, it's a frog. Uh, yeah. It's a very simplistic worm type. We have nematodes <laughs> here. Usually attack... Uh, Plants. Mm -hmm. So the next person that has a, uh, a a worm, a computer worm, should name it that. Uh, uh sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People would be like, so it looks like, like it upticked. So there was twenty two in twenty fifteen. There was twenty five in twenty sixteen. Thirty in twenty seventeen, and then it went back down in twenty eighteen to twenty eight. Hey, Ronnie, how happy are you that you joined us today? Um, uh, delighted. Yeah. Especially with that last article, that uh, guinea worm thing. <laughs> that it wasn't but, even an article. But you know what? <laughs> You learned something. Getting microchipped was definitely worth all those guinea worm removals. <laughs> oh, so yeah, I would take a chip over a worm <laughs> oh, yeah. any day. Please, Ben. Uh, uh, right until the chip protrudes from the end of your foot. Sure. So <laughs> for some reason, that makes... Remember that scene out of the first Matrix? Wasn't there like a weird worm removal in the first Yeah, one? it called into his belly button. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, was a, I it still looked like a remember, shrimp. Was it Wrath of Khan when, when they... Yeah, uh, the ear thing. Yep. As yeah. a kid, like I, I was little when that came out, and that... That messed with me for a That while. was a throwback to the old uh, Twilight Zone episode where the, the thing crawled in the guy's ear and the doctor said, you know, you, you just have to, to wait and it'll crawl out the other side and you'll scream in agony and pain. And, and so he does. He suffers through this for like a whole day or two days. And then, and then the dead bug falls out his other ear. And then the doctors say they have bad news. It looks like it laid eggs. And that's the end of the episode. The, uh... <laughs> All right, moving on, moving on. Have, have y'all watched Beastmaster? Yeah. Stop yeah. it. <laughs> Beastmaster. Right. Beastmaster, great. The sword and saucer ripped torn. So there's a scene in there where they put like a weird earworm slug in there. It's bright, bright green for some reason. I don't know. Fun story. You should, you should check that out. Yeah, yeah. and then it becomes I'll that on my, my Mac here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Peter, go ahead and type this in. Type what I tell you. Uh -huh. ready? All right, you ready? Yeah, yeah. Mango. Worm removal. <laughs> Mango worm? Yeah. All right, I will watch that later. Oh, new one. Oh, no, you won't. If it's the size of a mango. <laughs> You'll go, what? Is, oh. <laughs> yeah, Peter is left. He is vomiting. Now. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. You can hear him. He said, nope, he was checking his Yahoo mail. If you want more <laughs> quips like this from Justin, then you should join us on... Um, when, when are we doing this, uh, this <laughs> Jeopardy soon. thing? Dang it, the Jeopardy link that I clicked on was not the right one, because this was like December. Hold on. Uh, you're doing... Oh, July 31st. Friday, July 31st. We are doing IT Jeopardy with a CompTIA uh, focus on it, and that is uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 11 Pacific on IT Per TV's on-air page. So all you got to do is sign up for a free account. Don't have to pay anything. You can get to watch uh, Justin and three participants. Do we know yet, Justin? Are they... Uh, some of the people here, or, or I know we're going to get some. I don't know. I walk members. in, they put me in a, like a show host costume, and they go, go do your thing. And you ask awkward I'm questions. Like, okay. All right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, again, we've added uh, 16 more lose a turns and two bankrupts. <laughs> and Cheryl Sandberg. And Cheryl Sandberg is every clue. Yep. <laughs> um, but you'll never get to guess because you'll never spin the wheel properly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's coming up, like I said, uh, Friday, July 31st, so check that out. Uh, also, a couple other things coming up here as we uh, focus on CompTIA this month. We've got a um, webinar that's actually out uh, or that's this afternoon, uh, Thursday, July 9th. It is Stack Em Up, Build Your Career with CompTIA Certs, How to Stack CompTIA Certifications for Your Career Path. So if you're listening to this the morning that uh, the podcast comes out, go ahead and jump over to itpro.tv slash webinars to check that out. If you're listening after the fact, don't worry. It'll be up there um, and you can watch the archive of it. Uh, and later in the month, July 23rd, we've got Secure Your Future with CompTIA Certs, a guide to security certifications from CompTIA. That's why Daniel's not here today. He's really preparing for this, um, this webinar. So 
It's going to be fantastic. So, uh, yeah, head over to itbird.tv slash webinars. Check out the future ones and all of the past ones for you to enjoy. And finally, head over to go.itpro.tv slash technado. Uh, you can get a coupon code for 30% off your entire membership to IT Pro TV as long as you keep it active. Uh, you can also request information for your team if you're part of a business and uh, want to see a team trial and all the cool things that are available uh, for businesses. Uh, that's also there at go.itpro.tv tv slash technado well we uh even with Dan daniel not here we managed to get off the rails uh and so now we have isolated the problem is justin um <laughs> listen i've taught you something get anywhere or fiery serpent mm -hmm. right uh i will forewarn you if you go look up getting worms because you got interested there's a news article posted recently because of all the disease and things that's going around they're like a nearly extinct parasite may have resurfaced in Vietnam. So fantastic! Nice. Yeah, uh, we'll get to that next week. Stay away from the drinking water. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, it takes hours to remove from your body, but the images will never be removed from your mind if you watch never. that. So never. exactly, don't do it, as Don said. Uh, thanks, Ronnie. Special thanks to you for uh, for sitting in. Glad this to week. be here. Yeah, and uh, thank you, the rest of you guys, for you know what the stuff you're supposed to do anyway. <laughs> and uh, we'll see everybody else. Thank you for watching. You're the important part, and we'll see you next week right here on Technator with Don Bazette. Bye bye.